So, Kenny calls me the other night and he says, hey man, he says, would you mind introducing Susan on Friday? I said, sure. He says, hey, you probably know her best. He said, other than God, that, that I, I probably do. Um, and as I was telling Susan, I, the one thing I want to try not to do is be like a blithering idiot up here because after all 43 years, of, almost 43 years of marriage and, you know, walking through these challenges that we've walked through together um, and, and watching. When I need a miracle to see a miracle in my life, I turn to my wife. Okay, if there's any questions that there's a, a God who created this universe, I look at my wife. But I'm not going to go into all her story. That's, that's her. But I, I do know that there is a God in this universe who does transformation. He has miracles. So it's my pleasure. I'd like to introduce your speaker, Susan. God's grace and the miracle of, of his redeeming power that I can say I have a sober date of June the 17th of 2017. Yeah. And all the glory does go to God for that because that is not my first sober date. But hopefully it'll be my last. If I know that somebody told me a long time ago, if I keep doing what I'm doing, I'll keep getting what I'm getting. And I have no intention of stopping doing what I'm doing. So there's that. Anyway, um, they told me a long time ago when, when I was asked to, to share my story that it should have two parts or three parts. What it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. Um, and I already, uh, Chris and I were kind of talking about it, coming over here, and my story is probably no different than all of y'all's in the what it was like department. Um, I started doing, well, even going back before that. I'm an only child of an only child, so I was destined to be totally selfish and self-centered. <laughs> I got everything I wanted and everything I ever asked for growing up. I was not abused in any way, not neglected in any way, um, but I still felt from a very early age that I didn't fit. I felt like I didn't get the instruction manual that everybody else knew exactly what was going on and I didn't know and I always kind of left the house every morning going, I eh, don't know. And that was just how I felt. I always had this turmoil inside. Um, in fact, most of the pictures that my mom has of me at birthday parties and stuff, I was very not happy. I was very melancholy. Um, but they would always let me have my parents drank. Uh, my dad didn't drink alcoholically until way later, but drinking and alcohol was a part of our household. There were drinks before dinner, there were drinks during dinner, there were drinks after dinner, weekends were things that involved drinking, dad held, mom and dad always had parties, and I was always included in that. I was allowed to have sips of beer and sips of wine. So for me, it was normal. I didn't know that there were kids out there and households out there where drinking wasn't the main central part of the family. Um, but I knew that when I got to take a sip of beer, I got to take a sip of wine, there was this warmth that went down and it felt good. There was a mellowness that I got out of that, just out of a sip. So when I turned, when I was 14 years old, I, I, I had a boyfriend. 
who was much older, and he took me to a Christmas party, and they introduced me to this stuff called slow gin. <laughs> and I liked it. And I can remember that day, that night, and that stuff went down and it came back up the back of my neck and it made the hairs on the back of my neck just stand up. And I knew I had found what was gonna make it right. And it worked until I woke up later on that night and we had both passed out and we were in a lot of trouble because it was, anyway. But drinking was always going to be a part of my life from that point on. Um, every weekend there was drinking. There were other things, but this is AA, so I'm not going to get involved in the other things part of it. But there were other things as well. And all I knew was what I put in my body was what made me feel right. And that was okay, because I never got into trouble. I never got caught. If I didn't get caught, then I didn't get into trouble. If I didn't get into trouble, then it wasn't wrong. That was my logic. Um, but things went on, things progressed, and um, because of my drinking and my other stuff, I really didn't apply myself as much as I should have in school. So I didn't really qualify for college, but I lived in a small town and I knew I wanted out of that town. I don't know if you ever lived in a town that you knew you wanted to get out of, but that's what happened with me. And I, and, and I went by the recruiter's office one day, wandering, and I was like, hmm, that's a thought. And the Navy recruiter was really, really cute. So I thought I'd join the Navy. But the day I went in to get more information, the Navy recruiter was at lunch, but the Air Force recruiter was there. And he asked me into the office and he showed me these great, big, fantastic films about this new airplane that they had just invented. It was the F-15 and it was the new oh, great thing. And I could get in on the ground floor and be one of the first women to be in that career field working on the F-15. So I did, sign me up. It sounded like a good thing to do. Um, again, very little, my, my mom was dead set against it, but my dad liked the idea because he knew that wherever I went, they could travel. Um, so I joined and it was great because as soon as I got out of basic training, I found out that drinking was a large part of the military lifestyle. So I fit, fit right in. I just went right from drinking in high school to drinking in the military. It worked out really well. Um, and the very first assignment they sent me to was Germany. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, and that was a lot of fun, but it didn't, the sun didn't shine a whole lot, so I had an opportunity to go to Okinawa. Anyway, long story short, met this really, really tall, handsome guy there who was my best drinking buddy friend. It was Chris. And it was getting close to uh, the end of our assignment there. And, you know, we had been dating for three months. Yeah, about that. <laughs> and I uh, we said, well, you know, okay, let's get married. Why not? So we got married, um, and things progressed, and it was, it was cool. I mean, I still, I could drink, and drinking worked for me. Uh, again, I still, I didn't get into any trouble, nothing like that, but things um, started to get a little rocky. We, we moved to Denver. I decided it was time for us to settle down and grow up, so I got pregnant. Um, that I don't think that that was exactly what Chris had in mind, but that was what I had in mind. And I became a, a good wife, a good mommy. Um, and that became my central thing. Anyway, I, we had another kid and another base and things progressed and went kind of sideways. Um, there were fights and things started to not work so well. And then we went back to Germany and things really went sideways and things really started to not work so well. 
and Chris moved out. Chris got sober. Chris moved back in sober. I didn't quit drinking. I put my drinking ahead of my husband's sobriety. That's how selfish I was. That's the grip that drinking had on me. And that went on for years. He went to meetings, he got a sponsor, he worked the steps, he was getting connected to, to a higher power, and I was still drinking. And I, you know, tried to keep a handle on it as best I could. And, and then we retired and we got here and we retired and the kids by now were grown and they were having lives of their own. Um, within 30 days, both of our boys moved out of the house. One went in the Marine Corps and the other one got married. And suddenly I found myself with absolutely no identity because I had wrapped up 100% of my energy and my life into raising those two boys. And I had nothing. So what did I do? I filled it with more alcohol and more alcohol and more alcohol to the point where my husband was concerned about the condition I would be in when he came home from work. But I kept drinking because that didn't matter. What he thought, how he thought of me, how much he cared or how much he was concerned, that didn't matter. All that mattered was I had this hole in my gut the kids were gone. I had nothing. I had nothing to live for but alcohol. And I drank. And then, 2006, help me out. When did, we, when did you first bring me to a meeting? 2005, 2003. Whew. Sorry. He's my memory because I got very little memory about that. 2003, he, he thought that it would be a good idea maybe I started going to AA. Not because of my drinking, but because I had anger issues. And I went, and they had a nice little mate women's group that I was part of, and I would sit around, and I would listen to them talk. And I was there for about um, two weeks, and I finally said, I'm an alcoholic. And they all cried and hugged me, and I felt like, you know, this is pretty cool. Never had lady friends before, um, but it was pretty cool. And about hmm, just a little while later, I think it was just a, a couple years later, there was something else that, that came into my life, and another substance. And I thought I had it under control, and I thought, I thought I, that nobody knew what was going on. Uh, but I came home one day and um, Chris was at the dining room table and we were eating dinner and, and he told me that he had found my bottles, my pill bottles, because I had a really raging pain medication habit. And uh, he said, you know, you probably really need to, to think about going into rehab. And I did. I went to rehab for 30 days and I came out. Um, and I kicked the pill problem, but I went back to drinking. And how many relapses can we go through? I went through three more rehabs. I was asked to leave three sober living houses. I came in. A lot of you folks were here and saw me in the conditions that I would come into meetings drunk, thinking that nobody knew. But you all knew. You did. You had to have. But I was working the steps. I thought sure I was because I read the steps constantly. 
I mean, how it works was, was ingrained into my mind. The first step, admitting I was powerless over alcohol, that my, my life was unmanageable. My life was unmanageable. I agreed 100% with that. But I couldn't quite grasp the admitting I was powerless over anything. I knew if I tried hard enough, I could lick it. I could quit. So I kind of glossed over the first part of the first step. And that's why I continuously relapsed. And it wasn't until 2017, I got my last rehab, and I was, I was at my, my jumping off point. I was going to, before I went into rehab, I was going to bed at night and praying that God would take me because I didn't want to live anymore. And every morning I would wake up and I would be awake and I would be upset with God because he didn't take me. And I can remember I had to, to have some surgeries and one of the surgeries was, was pretty extensive and I ended up in ICU with pneumonia. And I, I remember I had that you know, bright light experience they talk about where this voice told me, you know, hey, it's not your time yet. But he also said, I've got something I need you to do. I've got something I need you to do. And it didn't make any sense to me. But I can remember being back there, this is when things looked quite a bit different in here, but I was back there and I heard two guys talking about working at a food pantry I knew nothing about, Tony, and one other person, and they were talking about needing help, and I just butted in. I'll help you. And I did, and I went, and I helped, but I was still drinking. So in 2017, like I said, when I went to that last, um, last rehab, Chris and I had joined a church. We had been baptized. Our, our son had actually brought, brought us to the Lord, and, and it, it was, he did our baptism, and it was so special. But I, again, continued to drink and continued to relapse, and I just couldn't figure it out because now, I mean, I've been baptized too, and I still can't get it. So I became one of those people that was constitutionally incapable, I'm sure. I, I mean, I, I figured I could never get sober. But when I got to, to rehab that last time, I was at my jumping off point because Chris had agreed that if I went to rehab, he would go to Florida to take care of some family business and I could get my stuff together. And I was there for about, I don't know, 48 hours, and I called him and he wouldn't answer the phone. And I was frantic. And little did I know that he had actually gone to Florida to contemplate what he was going to do because he was at that jumping off point with our marriage. That, that stuff was just so bad that he was so fed up with, with me and, and my behavior, and rightly so. I mean, what was there to love about me? Um, but he, he chose to stay with the marriage, and he came back. But I can remember while I was in rehab that, that time, I got down on my knees in my room and I just, I, I asked God, I said, I can't do this anymore. I need your help. And there was a voice that said, finally, now we can get somewhere. And I haven't had a drink since I went into that rehab. But that was when the first step really stuck for me because I understood the first part of that first step, that I had to admit that I was powerless over everything, not just alcohol. Because if there's a caveat, I'm gonna use it. I'm gonna find it and I'm gonna take it. But I had to admit that I was powerless over everything. And without God, 
my life was unmanageable. And once I did that, the desire to drink went away. The desire to use anything went away. But it was so easy at that point to look at the second step and come to believe that there was a power greater than me out there. And what was really neat was it proved to me that that power was God and he loved me and he cared for me. And he had a definite thing for me that only I could do. And he knew that I had to be sober to do it. So we went on to the third step and I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God. And I did that. And I do that every day. Today, yesterday, this morning, I wake up and the first thing I do is I hold my hands up above my head. And I say, God, this is your day. Help me to do what you want me to do. Show me where you want me to go. And let me do it. So from that point on, making a searching and fearless moral inventory was an interesting concept. Because everything that I figured I, I had in here was, was bad. You know, so it was easy to kind of bleh, vomit it and there it was. But then to admit to God, to myself, and to another human being what all those things were was a challenge. But I had an understanding sponsor who sat with me and allowed me to talk about all those things that I had had hidden. All of those hurts and those pains that I had stuffed down that I thought if I never talked about them that it would be okay. But then I went through six and seven, and I, I hit eight, and I hit another kind of brick wall because I really, really, really don't like to have to go to people and tell them what I did wrong. Just kind of, still to this day, it's kind of hard for me to say, hey, I'm sorry, but I will. But I did it. I made a list of all those people. I did that when I did my fourth and fifth step. And then in nine, I started to go around looking for the people. And today, I do 10 and 11. And I do the 12th step. I continue to take personal inventory. And when I'm wrong, I try to promptly admit it. I, sit, I seek through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God on a continuous basis, praying only for knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry that out. That is the strongest step for me today in my life because I can't do anything without his power and everything I want to do are things that, I, that he wants me to do. So I try to make sure that everything I'm doing is in line with, with what I sense he wants me to do. And so far, there's been a whole lot of really off the wall things that he's asked me to do. And I'm like, God, seriously, I, I can't, I, I don't know how, I can't. I don't have the power, I'm not strong enough, I'm not whatever. And every single time, he tells me, it's okay, I'll give you what you need. And he has. Today I run the food pantry that I started out just volunteering at. Now I got zero organizational skills. If you ever looked in my kitchen, you'd know that. I have trouble going to the grocery store because I, I get caught with squirrels. And I go, oh, well, that would be good, but to do that, I've got to go over here, and I've got to buy this and doing that. So I had to really learn to focus, to get organized, to make the food pantry work. Um, and today, through God's grace, it's working. And every time, I mean, we're a small food pantry and we don't have a really big budget. In case you haven't noticed, the cost of food is going up 
My budget is not going up. But every single time I get towards the end of the month and I look at the checkbook and it's a little bit low, I start to stress a little bit about it, but then I say a prayer. And I say, God, you asked me to do this. And so far, three times, we've been down to zero in the checkbook and in the mail or on the desk when I get into the pantry, there's an envelope with a check for exactly the same amount that I need to pay that month's bill. That's God. That's how God works in my life. But he does it so that he can prove to everybody else. He's not proving it to me. He's proving it to everybody else that's out there what he can do if we just get out of the way and let him do it. He doesn't need me to do it. I just happen to be there. But the joy of this, of this 11th step, as I continue, there's other things that I do. Um, Chris asked, last year, he got called to, to start a different group, working the 12 steps through biblically, through the Bible. And, you know, I told him, I said, hey, whatever I can do to help, I'll help you. Well, today we do that together, and God has blessed that program. But not because of anything that we have done, but because of the power of God and him working through us. I have the, the pleasure of going and getting calls and going out and working the steps with some of the girls out at Journey Recovery Center. That is the biggest blessing I can get because those girls are so hungry to find out what it's going to take to stay sober. They're so willing to take your instructions and they're so thankful that somebody is willing to take the time to go out there and do the, the work with them. It's kind of disheartening because when they leave, they leave and I, I don't hear from them again. But there's always a new one. <laughs> so it's like God is always replenishing. And yeah, I told you how brokenhearted I was at the beginning when I told you about my kids going away. Today, I have one child in Alabama with four kids, four of my granddaughters. And I got another one in Arkansas with four of my granddaughters. So all eight of my granddaughters are in states that start with A. The closest is nine hours away. But I'm okay being here. Because that hole that was so devastatingly empty when the boys left home, that I couldn't fill with anything but alcohol and drugs, today is filled by the power of God. And I have no desire, although I would love to go and live with them in either place, wherever they are, I can't pick and choose which one's more important. So it's more important for me to stay here where Chris is, where God has us doing what God has asked us to do. And I think that that's what we're all here for, is, is to find out exactly what it is that God wants us to do, God wants you to do, and then be willing to say, God, I don't have the power to do it, but I trust that you'll give me the power. And he will, if you let him. Um, one last thing. Oh, wow, I still got a lot of time. <laughs> this is so cool. Um, learning how to do this through the steps has been fun. Let me go on, though, to uh, having had a spiritual awakening, because that is so important today. And I didn't bring that up, but I need to. Um, when I really got really, really into the steps and really 
gave myself 100% to, to the steps in Alcoholics Anonymous. It was great. It was fantastic. I, my eyes were open and I was energetic and I was ready to find out more. Because the steps for me opened the door to spirituality. But I realized that once that door was open and I peeked through, that there was a light beyond that door that I wanted to know more about. And that was where I really, really needed to search and find more about God. And I did that, and that was my spiritual awakening. That, that for me, the ninth step promises are good, and that's what kept me sober for a long time. But that spiritual awakening that I needed to really stay sober and be sober and be productive happened when I went farther through church, through Bible study, through reading the word, through other communication that I have with ladies in my other 12-step group, with other ladies that I talk to in my Bible study group, in prayer groups, and that sort of thing, that that has strengthened my, my connection with God. And that is what has actually gotten me to the level of peace and serenity that I need to be happy today. And life isn't always good. We have bumps in the road. Things come up. Things happen. Um, we have arguments. I have health issues. But every single thing that has happened it's like God says, okay, that's a strengthening. Let's move forward. Okay. We'll, we'll polish that off. Let's move forward. So every time something happens, it gets a little bit better. And today I can say that the relationship that I have with Chris is a relationship that's based on actual true love. And it's love that I could only have found if I had worked these steps and applied myself and got out of the way and became the biblical wife that he needed me to become. Today, as we support each other, we love each other, and we do things together. We come here together. We go Monday nights together. We go Wednesday nights together. We still do things separately, but we are one. Just like God wants us to be, just like God expects us to be. Um, and that's the joy of looking at the final part of the ABCs is that I admitted that I was an alcoholic and could not manage my own life. I understood that probably no human power could have relieved my alcoholism, but I knew and I know today without a shadow of a doubt that God can and will. Finally, the very last paragraph on page 164, we read it a lot, but for me it's important. See to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is the great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road to happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Thank you.